Father, thank you again that we can meet here uh, in your name. Thank you we have your word. Uh, and we ask that you'll help us uh, hear what you have to say to us through your word. And we speak what is true and what honours you and what is for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I have too many things up here, but we'll fix that up. All right. All uh, right. One of the uh, uh, interesting uh, challenges whenever it comes to churches is what is it we should be doing? What are the things that we should be focusing our time upon? What are the things we should be focusing our energy upon? We were only talking about this at our men's group on, on Wednesday night that there are so many things we could be doing, but what really should we be doing? Uh, and I reminded of the words of uh, David Cook. He's the former uh, principal of SNBC, Sydney Missionary uh, Bible College. I was going to say up in Sydney. The name implies it's up in Sydney. And he talks about when he started off in, in parish ministry, uh, the words that kind of guided him to try and figure out what he should be doing and how he should be spending his time uh, were from a, an American historian. I think he has one of those quirky names like Marty Martin or something like that, one of those names that repeats itself. Anyway, and, and his basic one line for what you should be doing is to remember to make the main thing the main thing. The main thing is to remember to make the main thing the main thing. In other words, whatever the, the time you should be spending, it should be always thinking about what is the main thing, what is our main purpose as Christians and as the church. And, and, and whilst Christians have argued about this in various ways for, for a long time, I think it's pretty simple. Uh, we have it on our, on our board everywhere. For those who have come from other Anglican churches, it will look very familiar that we want to be a church for circular head, making disciples of Jesus. Why? Because they're Jesus' last words, aren't they? Before he, he, his ascension, what he says in Matthew 28, that all authority has been given to him, therefore go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and it's teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You see, when Christians get sidetracked from the main thing, problems happen. And we call those problems gongusmos. That's my random Greek word of the day that you're going to have embedded in your mind. It's probably not a good word to have embedded in your mind. But gongusmos is this really fun Greek word. It's one of those onomatopoeic words, you know, like crash, bang, etc. It's the word for grumbling and murmuring and discontent. It's when there's problems going on at church, there's gongusmos, 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 because that's the sound people make as they are starting to get a bit cranky about everything going on. When gongusmos happens, problems happen. That's when we get sidetracked from the main thing. It's You've all been part of churches and congregations at various points of time that have got sidetracked. And sometimes it's about tri trifle things, isn't it? It's, it's when you need to replace the carpet and you have an have a, have a over my dead body moment because one person wants it red and one person wants it more of a, 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 a darker crimson colour. It, it can be over what songs we sing at church. It can be over all sorts of things. I recently read a story, uh, Kent Hughes tells this story, that there was this uh, church, this relatively I think, prominent church in Dallas, Texas. Dallas is basically this uh, Christian city over there. It's got the highest percentage of church-going people, I think, in America. And so church news becomes just regular media news. And apparently this church basically fell apart and, 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 and went to court over a property battle because everyone in the church was arguing about you know, who should end up with everything because they decided they cannot meet together anymore. And, and it went back and forward and eventually they got, basically had to figure it out with their denomination and it turned out that the whole issue, the whole guzmo started because they're having a parish dinner and uh, one of the elders got served a small slice of ham to the child sitting next to him. That got reported in the paper. Everyone in Dallas got to read about that church and why it was having a fight because one of the elders didn't get enough ham. Friends, maybe, maybe. And so when we get sidetracked from our ma the main thing, this is when this sort of this grumbling and this murmuring happens. 
And so as we continue this series in the book of Acts, and we've been seeing all these different occasions where we see how does the early church handle this issue? How does it handle this situation that comes up? And so now we're going to see how it handles the, the, the first bit of this grumbling and mumbling, this gongusmos, 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 that's going on in the church. And so we're going to see that there is the problem. We'll see that in the first verse. The solution is then offered. We'll see the result of that solution. And then we'll consider what it all might mean for our church here in Circular Head. Uh, So, uh, the passage begins, Acts 6, verse 1, we're told that in those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. That's the problem that's going on. We have these two groups amongst the Christian community. We have Hellenistic Jews. So remember, everyone in the community is from a Jewish uh, background at this point in time. We're still at this point in the book of Acts. But some of them are Hellenistic and some of them are Hebraic, which which in simple terms means some of them were Greek speakers and some of them were were Hebrew or Aramaic speakers. But there's a little bit more to it than that. There's there's cultural baggage attached to it because you've got someone like uh, Saul Paul, who's from Tarsus, who's a Greek speaker, but he describes himself in Philippians as a Hebrew of Hebrews because culturally he was more aligned with what was going on in Judea rather than what was going on in the rest of the world. And this was, a, this was baggage that the church really inherited. This was an issue that was going on amongst the Jews at the time for quite some time up to that. And so we're told that, the, the, I mean, basically the power brokers in the church at the time, they were Hebraic Jews. And so the the Greek ones, the Hellenistic Jews, well, when it came to the time of distributing bread, because they have these widows who are part of the church community, they can't provide for themselves, they need the the church. Remember, there's all these common funds going on, all these people have been selling property to be able to give to people like these poor widows. But the Greek-speaking ones are saying, we're getting overlooked. They're getting two loaves of bread, we're only getting half a loaf of bread. What's going on here? And so there is, we're told... This gongusmos happening. The word complained is this this grumbling. There's this grumbling going on in the background. Now, there's actually lots of really interesting links in this passage with the book of Exodus. Uh, Exodus is kind of this this narrative where, of course, there's well, already you know there's similarity, don't you? We have the, the, the Passover scene in Exodus before God's great salvation act, where he, he he rescues his people out of Egypt, and of course in the in this period we've already had the Passover celebration. We've had Christ die on the cross. We have him rise from the grave. We have the establishment of the new community, the new people of God. So there's these similarities, and funnily enough. Guess what happened back in Exodus? Uh, Just after they have Exodus, just after they've seen that, they've seen the ten plagues, they've seen God mightily at work, they've seen uh, him part the sea, they've crossed over the sea. I mean, how many more signs do you need that God is good and God is on your side? But of course, what we read in Exodus 15 through to Exodus 17 is Gongusmos. Uh, in the, in the pre Christian Greek translation of the, the Old Testament, the Septuagint, this word appears something like nine times in three chapters. The people are grumbling, the people are grumbling, the people are grumbling. Why are they grumbling? For those of you who remember your Exodus, uh, there's, of course, hang on, we used to be able to eat heaps of food back in Egypt. There's no food out here, we're in the desert. And God provides them with, with the manna and the quail. And hang on, there's nothing to drink. And so then God provides them with water to drink. And then there's, there's grumbling going on in the new people of God in the Exodus story. And funnily enough, we turn to Acts 6, and after they've gone through all these similar experiences, now there is this grumbling going on. Uh, the very quick warning, kind of before we move on to the, the solution to the problem, is that I don't think this is a major issue we, 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 we have here. I don't think we're, we're big grumblers. Although maybe I'm just like, you know, desensitised to it, you know, selective hearing or something like that. But I don't think that's our big issue. But every church in every place and every time, there is the danger that this gongusmosing, this grumbling going on in the background, can sidetrack us from our mission and tear things apart. And so the basic reminders are, I mean, we know this, don't we? We know that when we have a problem with someone in the next pew... 
It's very hard not to point at someone at this point. But what we have is a problem with someone in the next pew. The, the solution to that problem isn't to go and talk to someone in a different pew about that person we have a problem with. Right? The solution is go and speak to that person. Go and speak to your brother or sister in Christ and try and figure it out. And it can't be work, worked out. Then maybe that's when you might include someone like me and we can try and figure it out. But that's where problems happen when you just start talking to everyone else other than the person you should be talking to. Likewise, if your problem is less with, say, an individual and more with something we are doing here at church, then raise the issue with, well, I mean, I'm probably the best person or someone on parish council you can talk to and ask, why is it we do this? Why is it we do that? And hopefully we'll have a good answer. That might help explain what's going on. You might think, why aren't we doing that? And you know what? You might have a great idea and that makes me realise we should do something differently. But the point is, communicate over it rather than just grumble in the background. But thankfully, in the early church, somehow the grumbling got to the apostles uh, and they came up with this solution that we read in verse 2 through verse 4. So let's look at the solution there. We're told the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. You can see what's happened here, isn't it? That that the problem has been raised, it's got back to the the 12, and there's this temptation for them to be distracted from doing the main thing. It's just that there's temptation for them to try and take over and fix the problem themselves and do this work themselves and and, and get involved in that way. But they see there's a genuine issue that, 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 that these widows need to be cared for and provided for, but it's not for them to do that. They say it would not be right for us. The word is basically the word for pleasing. It would not be pleasing really in God's sight for us to neglect the ministry of his word in order to go and fix this issue of the daily distribution of bread. And so their solution is to choose these seven men who are full of the spirit and wisdom and give the responsibility to them so that the apostles can devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, if you weren't convinced that there were many links between the Acts story and the Exodus story based on my grumbling, because, you know, you might rightly say people have grumbled throughout history. Big whoop, they grumbled back in Exodus 15 to 17. But for those of you who have Bibles, it's good to look at it. It's not going to appear on the screen. But in Exodus 18, so just after we have this grumble, 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 grumble that's going on, uh, Moses visits his father-in-law, uh, his father-in-law, Jethro, there's a name that's just disappeared out of society, hasn't it? It's hard not to think about the Beverly Hillbillies, though, whenever you think about <laughs> Moses' father-in-law. That's right. A few people in the room are old enough to know that. Why I know about it, I don't know. I think my parents made me watch it or something when I was a kid. Anyway, so Moses is with his father-in-law, Jethro, and Jethro is basically watching Moses on the job. And Moses starts from the crack of dawn uh, until uh, late at night. He's there basically uh, standing, sitting in this sort of judge position where everyone who has any kind of issue whatsoever is coming to him. And there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. And Moses is the one dude responsible for figuring out all the issues they have. And Jethro basically looks at him and just says in verse 17, what you are doing is not good. Same sort of phrase used in Acts 6 when the apostles realise that what they're doing isn't right. But uh, Jephro says, it's not good what you're doing. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I'll give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men, who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands and hundreds and fifties as uh, uh, and fifties. And have them serve as judges and often continues 
ongoing. You see how similar the story is there? The apostles realise they've got too much work to do. Moses has got too much work to do. And instead of them trying to do it all, they basically take on Jethro's advice and apply it to Acts 6, don't they? Moses is told by his father-in-law, what's your job? Your job is to intercede on behalf of the people. Your job is to pray for the people to God. And your job is to teach the people God's decrees so they know how to live his way. And the apostles realise, actually, our job is to pray and to do the ministry of the word, to teach the people God's word and how to live his way. And so the solution that Jethro comes up with is find these capable, godly men and appoint them to do the task. And what's the solution in Acts 6? Appoint these capable, godly men to be the solution to do this task. There's an interesting kind of overlap in the stories that's going on there. Now, one of the things that it's worth considering is they have this issue where basically they need some capable people to figure out the food distribution ministry of the church. If we were coming up with a job description and, and, and some sort of criteria for who it is we would be looking for to take on this role, what would we be looking for? You see, I think if we're honest with ourselves... Our default would be to make the criteria be all about competency. We want to make sure they have experience in a management position. Uh, we hope they would have spent some time working in a not-for-profit not sector. They, we want to make sure they have the ability to, to think about X, Y, and Z. We would be thinking about their competency. Now, competency is part of this. They're, they're, they're told to find someone who is full of the spirit and wisdom, and I think part of this wisdom is you know, living God's way in God's world, and that will involve how to help uh, practically do something in this situation. Likewise, for Moses, he was told to find capable men to do this task. But the main point of who they're meant to find is actually find people with convictions and with character. They're meant to, Moses is meant to find these men who would fear God, who have this upstanding reputation in the community. Uh, here in Acts 6, we're told they're meant to find these men who are known, uh, the emphasis here is that they are known by the community, that people actually witness that they have good reputation. They have this good reputation, they're known to be full of the spirit and of wisdom. Find people with good character, find people with the right convictions, and yes, they should be able to do the work as well. But the priority is their character and convictions rather than just their capability. And so that's something that when we find ourselves in situations where we need to appoint someone and some of you are in a situation where you're looking at your church elsewhere is looking for a, for a minister, you should be looking for someone of character and conviction and prioritising that, but also make sure they can do the, the, yeah, the teaching and whatever else too. But don't get lured by teaching without character and conviction to back that up. That's something that we should be looking for. And the result of this, fairly quickly, is that things go really well. Uh, we're told in verse 5 to 7 that the proposal pleased the whole group. And so they chose Stephen. He was a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And they chose Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles. The apostles prayed and laid hands on them. And we're told that the word of God spread the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, which seems to be an incredible thing given how many rapid increases they already had, but it increased rapidly, including many priests coming to put their trust in Christ. We go from a gongusmosing going on in the community to people being pleased. Now, we know relatively little about the, five, the, the last five. Obviously, Stephen we know a great deal about. We're going to hear all about his story next week. Philip we'll hear about a little bit later. We get to Acts chapter 8, and, and, and he also has this ministry where he isn't just helping them, but, but he is teaching the word as well. The other five, we know basically nothing about them. There's one or two sort of stories from church history, but effectively, they're no names. The main thing that pretty much all, all people agree on is that the emphasis is, that we're meant to pick up on is their names themselves and what kind of names. It's funny, I see I have Acts 4 or 5 on the screen, which means that one of my slides has been deleted. That's frustrating. Hopefully you guys noticed that. 
Uh, no one yelled out to me, though. Uh, but if you have Bibles, you can read their names in Acts chapter 6, verse 5 through 7. And you re- the thing you notice about their names is that their names are not the names you would expect. You would expect in this community that, given the leadership and, and, and what the background they all were, you would expect to hear names like Yaakov and Yitzhak and Yoel and Shmuel and Shlomo and Darwin. You're expecting to hear Jewish names. But they're all Greek names. And so the apostles have realised that even though they're all Hebraic Jews and they probably naturally prefer that, they realise, hang on, to, to, to make the, the community work, to, to, to realise that the problem is that the Hellenistic Jews are feeling excluded here, we actually need to empower their own people to fix the problem and to give them this authority by laying hands on them and showing we actually approve of them. They are just as much leaders of our community as the Hebraic Jews. There's great wisdom in how they fix the problem and, the solu- and, and, of course, the outcome is this rapid growth in the church. <laughs> Speaking of the church, we then get to our church. And what does this passage mean? What's the so what for us? Uh, I have found preparing this passage and this message particularly tricky this week. Uh, sermons fall into the tricky category for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is when they're just, you know, like it's some sort of uh, difficult passage, theological issue that, you know, people find hard to understand. You've got to do a lot of work on that. Another reason is when it's on a topic that is sensitive. Usually it's got to do uh, with uh, all things related to the bedroom and, and those sermons are always challenging to, to talk about. But this one has been challenging because it's just... Awkwardly hard not to insert yourself into the scene and try and think, well, what does this practically mean? Even though I am not an apostle, but the closest thing in the modern church to to the relationship is that I I have got this sort of role of being someone who is meant to be paying attention to prayer and the ministry of the word when the temptation is always to do everything else. And so it's a passage that's quite confronting for me and makes me reflect on what I do and how I spend my time and what my priorities ought to be. Uh, I read recently uh, D.B. Knox, Broughton Knox, he's a former principal at Moore College. Uh, he heard through a friend uh, that uh, Billy Graham, it must have been around the time he kind of retired from his sort of more regular evangelistic ministries, it was, it was still a long time ago he said these words. But, but someone asked Billy, If you could have your time again, what would you do differently? And he said, if he had his time again, he would have devoted more of his time to prayer and to study of the Word. It's hard to imagine someone like Billy Graham saying that answer because he's so known for his prayer, he's so known for his preaching of the Word, and yet he realised that actually he failed to do as much of that as he ought. I, uh, some of you saw that photo when I was trying to find the slide. That photo is an incredibly bad uh, image. It's a bad image anyway, and our screen is terrible. But if you can't make it out, that is a picture of the Bishop of Lynn and I and a little two-year-old Naomi. Uh, that picture is from the 11th of March, 2017. Uh, that was the day that I was... Uh, I think the word is in, in, inducted, which is a strange word to use. Uh, but basically, when I became the, 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 the minister of this church, uh, some of you were here, probably not many of you actually were here on that day. Uh, but on that day, uh, what happened as part of this whole, this whole sort of service of, 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 of installing me, or inducting, whatever the word I meant to use is, whatever, however I became the minister here, part of that service is this sort of awkward bit where the bishop publicly examines me. And so he asks 10 questions. I won't read all 10 questions now. They're from the the ordinal part of our our Anglican liturgy, the the Anglican prayer book. But the first question is basically asking if I feel called to this ministry, and I have to affirm that. But I'll read to you question two and three. Note the priority of the questions as well. Question two. Are you convinced that the Holy Scriptures contain all doctrine necessary for eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? And are you determined to instruct from these Scriptures the people committed to your care, teaching nothing is essential to salvation which cannot be demonstrated from the Scriptures? 
my answer that, you know, I mean, it's told, I'm told what to answer, is I am convinced and will do so by God's grace. And the other question is, will you be diligent in prayer and in the study of the Holy Scriptures? And I promised before you, at least those of you who are there, but it's implied all of you, that I will by God's grace. Uh, you can see the wisdom of those questions from the ordinal. They're basically taken straight out of Acts 6, aren't they? That the focus of my job is to make sure that I teach the Bible and I pray and I pray and I pray some more for you. And so for me, I realise that reflecting on this is I need to develop the skill of knowing when to say no. I know some of you uh, I think about this quite a lot, that, that there's this whole idea that when you say yes to something in life, what you've got to realise is that when you say yes to taking on a new task or going to an event or running this or running that, you're actually saying no to something that you're already doing in life because you've got to take some time away from somewhere else to do that. Or to put it another way, you've got to figure out, realise that sometimes when you say no to doing something, you shouldn't feel bad that you're saying no to, to doing what might be a good thing if the reason for doing so is that you're actually saying, yes, I need to devote my time more to this good thing that I'm already doing. And so I find myself challenged by this passage to reflect on how I spend my time. Am I, can I say that I am doing the best job I can at fulfilling those promises I made to you? There are, there are many aspects of my job, some of it are kind of hard to avoid in 21st century church, but some of it I can avoid, and I need to say no to some things. Uh, a really simple, obvious one that I, I maybe won't go into full detail on, but somehow over these past few years, I've just found myself on seemingly endless boards or committees or similar type things. I think six or seven different ones over the past few years, I've found myself, some of them on and off, on, and, and, and some of them align quite naturally with my role. Uh, I was in the Northern Nomination Committee. We met to figure out who the next uh, minister in Olmerson should be. That's a good thing to do. But some of them are pretty hard to align with my priority of apparently spending time in the Word and prayer. <coughs> so I have to more seriously consider, I probably need to say no and, and probably remove myself for the sake of the Gospel and for the sake of my, the promises I made that I, what I would do to bless you. And so there's the questions you can be asking me. Am I actually devoting myself to the word and prayer? Am I wrestling in prayer for you? Because if I'm not doing that, who is? So there are questions that I need to ask of myself. But there are also questions that, that you will need to ponder as well. For are you making the main thing the main thing in how you spend your time and how you devote your time and your energy? You see, for parents in the room, there is the temptation to, to, to do everything. The temptation is to make sure your kid is the best student at school. The temptation is to make sure your, 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 your kid is the best athlete, the best musician, the best dancer, whatever. And there are so many good things that you can be doing as a parent in helping them. But what's the main thing that you're meant to be doing? What does God primarily expect you to be doing? We heard Beck say it, didn't we? Teach your kids about Jesus. And so if all these other things are getting in the way of you being able to, 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 to disciple your kids, then you need to make sure the main thing is the main thing. That applies really to all of us and how we spend our time. Uh, next week, we're going to do a survey. Uh, we used to do these surveys pre-COVID and they kind of disappeared uh, in the couple of years since then. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, ironic that I coughed as I said the word COVID. Um, <laughs> Anyway, but we, but we used to do these, 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 these surveys where we would get you to give some feedback about, you know, what things you like about church, what things maybe you would like to see improved. I guess that's the bit where you get to go on guzmos on paper and hopefully I'll talk to you about it rather than just, you know, let it sit. Uh, there will there, there, be uh, options to think about joining a home group because we really want everybody in church to be part of a, a small group where you get to go deeper with people and build better relationships and, and care for one another in a more intimate way. And so we'll have options for that. But also trying to think, are there gifts that you have because God has given you his Holy Spirit, he has equipped you to bless one another with these gifts you have. So how can you be using them to serve our church? 
And so you'll have a week to be able to think and pray before ticking a box or I think there'll be an online survey for those that prefer that method. So we can try and think about planning for next year, but also how we can make sure that we're on about the main thing. There are so many good things going on at church right now. Friday night, we had this wonderful night at youth group. Uh, There were 30-something kids there uh, who came along, plus, uh, and, 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 and they got to hear about Jesus. They got to have lots of fun together. It was just a good night. I, I found myself chatting to, to some kids who have a, a non-church background, and they're asking me these wonderful questions about faith. They're, they're wrestling with faith at a kind of a 12- and 14-year-old level, and it was really great. But at the moment, I'm looking at next year, and especially by about the middle of next year, and realising that, I might actually be able to keep the youth group running because we're just going to run out of leaders. There, you know, we, we farewell Charlie a few weeks ago and, and he has been involved. We obviously have Sarah that you, you know, are there up the coast today, but Sarah is obviously not going to be involved next year in youth group given the, the, the bubble that's going to be appearing soon. We, uh, we, 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 we've got this shortage there, so we need people who are going to be willing to, to help out in various ways. Our kids' church is always needing people. Where if we're going to start more home groups, then we'll need more people who are willing to, to lead those groups or to host those groups, to welcome people into their home. There, some of you might be thinking, I'm not really a, a, you know, a, a word-based ministry person. It's not really my gifting. But if you're behind the scenes, it might be the maintenance of, of, of things. It might be administrative stuff. My goodness, there is endless administrative things that people can be doing to, to help out uh, here. There, are, there are, the, the, the list goes on. You see, even if, if you find yourself doing what may not look like the main thing, but you might be enabling others to do the main thing in disciple making. As you are cleaning the building, someone else can be talking to someone and sharing their faith with them. You get the logic of this. You see, the image of the Bible isn't that necessarily the, the word ministry is more important. We need to, to emphasise that above all else. But the point is, but, but yes, we need to be making disciples, but we all actually have a part to play in that. The image that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 is, of course, the image of the body. And there's no one part of the body more important than the other. They, they all need to be honoured and they all need to work together. And so if this church is going to be a church that is making disciples of the Lord Jesus, if this church is going to be a church that makes the main thing the main thing, then we actually need every part of the body playing its part. It may not be you running kids' church, it may not be you leading youth group, but it may be you taking on one of the tasks that our youth leaders are doing that really isn't the the main thing and alleviating some of the work they're doing. Might be you helping out with the gardening, the maintenance, the whatever it might be. Because friends, there are still literally thousands of people in our district who need to know the Lord Jesus. There is so much work to do. And we need each and every one of us to be playing our part in making disciples of the Lord Jesus for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your goodness. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the wisdom of the early church and how they handled that situation. We ask that you help us be a church that's all about making disciples of the Lord Jesus. Father, I'm sorry when I don't dedicate myself to the word and to prayer. I ask that by your spirit you will convict and change and help me do that more for the sake of your people. And Father, I ask that in thanks that you have given us your spirit, that you have given us gifts, and I ask that you will give us the wisdom to know how we can use them for your glory and for the growth of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.